Time to talk about the Reshift Salient or the Reshift Slaughterhouse or the Reshift Meat Grinder, depending on who you ask. So the Reshift Meat Grinder was a name given by the Soviet soldiers to the Reshift Salient or the battles around there. So big thank you here to all Patreons who voted on this topic. So what is this? This is basically the Red Army's forgotten battles of a 15 months campaign, so from January 1942 to March 1943. Now, if you didn't hear about this battle or these battles before, there is a reason for this and I made a video about this. Why? You probably never heard about this. Now for this video I looked at German and also Russian literature a bit and in one point I can give you both sides of the view, which is quite interesting. Now first, a little bit of orientation. So, Reshev was a very important town and it was the center point of the Reshev salient. Now, the Reshev salient was basically that was left after the Soviet counterattack against the Germans in winter 1941-1942. Basically stuck out like a sword towards Moscow, if you take the more dramatic point of one English author. Now, as you can see, this is quite important because it was still a threat toward the Soviet capital. And the Soviets, for the most part, assumed that in 1942 the Germans would attack again and would try to strike Moscow and not go for the south against Stalingrad. Additionally, Heeresgruppe Mitte, Army Group Center, was the strongest Heeresgruppe of the Germans. And it was also seen as a direct way to the Reich. So, one major aspect was the destruction and encirclement of Army Group Center. Several important railway lines ran through this area as well. And what is very important here is that the conventional view for 1942 is that the Germans started Case Blue and were on the attack again during the summer and then reached Stalingrad and then the counteroffensive happened, the Soviet counteroffensive. Now, as you can see, the conventional view is the Germans attacked and the Soviets were on the defensive again like in summer 1941. Yet the issue is, in the reserve salient area, for the most part, the Soviets were attacking. Out of these 15 months, eight months were offensive operations by the Soviets, active offensive operations. So thus, this, these battles or this campaign is also sometimes called the forgotten battles. And it was not a minor issue. Now, for the Germans, for 1942, the, the focus was clearly in the southern area where Kiss Blue happened and the offensive was going on. For, for a center, there was a lack of reinforcements, there was also a lack of the Luftwaffe. The Germans didn't completely cease operations, but the goal of all these operations was to strengthen the defensive of the Reshef salient, not to conduct any strategic operations. Now, in total, four major Soviet operations happened and they all had the attempt to encircle army group center and destroy it. Now let's look at this chronologically. The first Soviet operation was from January to April 1942. And it was performed by cavalry and also airborne formations mainly. And the cavalry was initially quite successful. It cut the railway line between Smolensk and Vyazma. This was done to a certain degree by the so-called Belov Group under General Belov. For the airborne units, they were less successful. They did some successful landings, but the problem was there was a lack of transport aircraft and also coordination. So they were, for the most part, they could create some, uh, some pockets inside the German lines, but yeah, were sooner or later destroyed. Now, very important here, a later very um, known German general model was actually deployed in around February 1942. He replaced the command of the 9th Army, who was not deemed fit for the purpose. And in February 1942, Zukov was actually assigned to this area as well. So as you can see, even from the, from the generals deployed there, this was not a sideshow. Now the Soviets continued their attacks in March again, but this was, but then Rasputista, the, the toying of the snow and everything happened, so everything turned into a, a huge sea of mud. And in April, the 33rd army was basically encircled and destroyed by the, by the Germans. Now this was one of the 
highest and bloodiest battle of this of this whole Reshev battles and the losses are around 700 to 900,000 depending on the source. So quite extensive amount of losses here. Now after this major sort operation the German tried to stabilize the CLA and clear out several pockets the Soviets created or still held. So they were Operation Hanover 1 and Hanover 2 and the Soviets actually broke out with the Group Belov, with this cavalry unit. And in Operation Seidlitz in July the Germans destroyed the 39th Army. So they basically stabilized large parts of the salient and cleared out Soviet troops that penetrated during the previous battles. Additionally, there should also be mentioned Operation Kreml, which was the whole idea for the Germans was to, to convince the Soviets that the attack in the summer would be against Moscow again on the center. So there were several plans and headquarters created to, to feign basically an attack. We, don't, we know that, that the Soviets in Stalin were convinced that the Germans would attack again in the center area or against Moscow. Yet, what I found, nobody knows if this operation actually was effective or not. Now from late July to late September 1942, the Soviets conducted the second major offensive operation. And first the German few. There were a few shallow penetrations in the area, but they were already a threat because Reshev was very close to the defensive lines. So they had to actually redeploy some troops that were scheduled for another operation. And also Hitler allows to use the reserves of Heeresgruppe Mitte of Army Group Center. And initially the Germans wanted to do an organized counterattack when they bring in the new units, but then they realized, okay, we actually can't do this. And they immediately deploy all the troops they got once they are basically redeployed. So no, no concentrating them and for concentrated because the situation is that critical. And they actually fear of running out of manpower. Now here Model comes into play, he's very good at mobilizing troops to defense. So what he does to a certain degree, he uses construction units and everyone else and, and basically shovels, him, shovels them to the front to hold the line. And there's a very important aspect here. The German military historians in Germany in the Second World War conclude that Hitler probably drew the wrong conclusion from these battles. Because the Germans held out, and this was his view all along, he was like, the enemy will wear out sooner than we do. And this likely affected his decision around Stalingrad. At least that is their assumption. We can tell, but it's a very, very interesting point on the side, because usually most people talk about this Dimyansk airlift. Anyway, now the Russian view is actually a bit different. Russian author points out the Germans have very strong defensive lines and everything. And it's quite interesting because the German view actually notes that for the summer, the German defensive line were not that strong, quite contrary to related operations during winter. And one major problem for the Soviets was that there was no recon in depth, so they saw the outer lines, but not how deep they were. And for the most part, they only penetrate the first line of defense. Now the Soviets take heavy criticism after and they analyze their failure, and they point out all the attacks were mostly uncoordinated, the different arms didn't coordinate well with another, no exploitation of break-ins, indecision, lack of initi initiative and everything. It is very important to point out that the Soviets on the strategic side had still the initiative. They were attacking. As such, the Germans couldn't launch their various attacks they had planned, like Operation Wilberwind, and they could also not redeploy. So they had to bring in reinforcements and had to use the reserves. So as you can see, although the Soviet attack was not successful, from the strategic point, the Germans were basically on the back foot. Now, the third offensive was in November to December 1942, so parallel to Operation Uranus, and this operation is called Operation Mars. As the name kind of suggests, there's some similarity there, and Glantz actually calls them twin operations. Because the goal of Operation Uranus was to encircle the 6th Army at Stalingrad, whereas 
The goal of Operation Mars was to encircle the 9th Army of Model in the Regisseme. Now, the Germans are better dug in than in the summer, they have better fortifications, they have more artillery and they have more anti-tank guns. Yet despite this, the Soviets managed to make, achieve a break-in and cut the railway line between Rishev and Sibiaka. For a short amount of time, the Germans can redeploy and send in reinforcements and save the situation, and they also start a counter-attack and encircle about 40,000 Soviets. Yet, they also get one of their units encircled about 7,000 men. The counter-attacks here fail, and Hitler orders to hold them out, and when he gives the breakout order, it's too late again. It's very similar to Stalingrad, or on a very minor aspect. Generally, this Operation Mars was also a failure, and it's called sometimes Shukov's greatest defeat. Generally, it was a German success, yet some of their formations bleed out extensively. Now, the Germans have like these five criteria how they qualify divisions, fully capable for all operations, then suited for after minor refit, and then there's like suited for defensive operations and, and all this. I, I made a video where I talk about this in detail. And in some cases, they now consider some of their formations not even fit for defensive operations. So the battle of attrition against the Germans is working out. Now the Soviets again do analysis and a conclusion what went wrong during the offensive. The author of the Russia Slaughterhouse points out a very interesting aspect. She notes it's basically almost a one-on-one -on -one copy of the previous analysis of the previous offensive what went wrong. Now let's look at the situation in late 1942, early 1943. So Stalingrad happened, the Germans got their army encircled. They are in quite a shock because they never assumed that the Soviets would be capable to encircle one of their large units and to conduct such a major operation successfully after the previous errors they have seen consequently even during case blue. Now the salient, the Reshev salient is still a threat against Moscow, but their units are sometimes not capable of defending anymore. Their units bled out, so there's no ability to attack. And also the, the, the salient points out there, so the threat of being encircled again or being encircled here is also quite extensive. So why hold on? Because there's no, it doesn't make sense anymore. So Kluge recommends in January 1943 to abandon the rash of salient and Hitler agrees. This leads to the evacuation operation Buffalo. This means building up defensive lines in the rear to areas where the troops can retreat. Also it's a staged withdrawal and you need to build roads and infrastructure to bring all back all the artillery, all the heavy equipment and everything around this. Additionally, the Germans take all a lot of loot out there and also bring several civilians with them, which they basically kidnap. And what they also do is of course scorched earth policies, demolition of tracks, laying out mines everywhere. And the whole operation is from the 1st of March to the 24th of March. Now, of course, the Soviets don't just sit there and wait till the Germans evacuate. The fourth offensive is now launched. And their goal is to encircle the troops in the rush of salient again. Yet they advance slowly. There are several reasons for this. The Germans basically retreat during the day, but keep the artillery and several rear guards unit there fighting. So they, they fight back, they have staged about every 10 to 12 kilometers. They have a defensive set, uh, situation set up, like there's artillery stored there, and they fire all the ammunition till it's gone, and then they retreat further back. Usually the artillery or the rear guard units retreat during the night, whereas everyone else retreats during the day. Also, they, they conduct several counterattacks with mobile units, for instance, tanks and Sturks. Like the other battles, this is not a success for the Soviets. Heeresgruppe Mitte was able to withdraw. The salient, although, is cleared because the Germans left it. And for the Germans, the front is shortened, as is for the Soviets, and about 20 divisions for the Germans are freed up 
They can use now as reserves or redeploy it somewhere else. Now, some general points about these battles. It's very important here that these battles resemble more the fighting of World War I than what is commonly known as the Battle of World War II. So, a lot of losses for very few territorial gains. Forests, swamps, trenches, fortifications, dug in, artillery fighting and everything. And for, for the 15 months everything took, the Soviets are on attack 8 months, so more than 50% of the time they conduct major offensive operations. Now a short look at the Soviet losses here. The losses are comparable to the Battle of Stalingrad and we know for the active fighting that happened, the Soviets had about 1.3 million losses, so total losses, wounded, killed in action, missing in action, is about 1.3 million, this is more than in Stalingrad. The irrecoverable losses were about 433 for the Reshev against 478 at Stalingrad. But again, this is only for the eight months of active fighting. And there's also a point that the loss numbers are quite problematic. There's the author of Reshev Slaughterhouse discusses the various points with, with the loss numbers and everything. And she, she finally concludes, okay, we can't really know for sure. You will see a quote here, exactly what her words are about this. Now the question what some of you will probably bring up is who won? Well, this is a rather complicated answer here because if you look at it, the Soviets tried for 15 months to destroy Army Group 7 and clear out the Reshev salient. They didn't man manage to destroy Army Group Center and in the end they got the Reshev salient but because the Germans withdrew. So you could say, oh yeah, they cleared out the salient but you could also say, yeah, but they never destroyed the units they want to destroy or the formations. So the Germans held and then withdrew. But at the same time, the Germans were not able to hold the salient any longer. And it also had no value for them anymore because they couldn't go on the attack again. So it was a rather loose, useless endeavor and holding on made no sense. On a tactical level, the Germans held the position, but strategically, basically, they lost in the long run. Additionally, both sides suffered extensive losses. Another major issue was the Germans could not redeploy units, for instance, to the south, to the Battle of Stalingrad. Of course, this brings up another question. Would there be a difference for Case Blue if the Reshev Salient was not present? And the answer is rather simple and no. Because if the threat in the center is not there, the Soviets have way more formations and units and manpower and equipment available somewhere else. So the enemy will always react to your moves or the enemy always gets a vote. If the Reshev salient is not there, well, then the Germans have more units available, but so have the Soviets. Well, I hope you got a basic overview about the battles of Reshev. Thank you for voting on this topic to all my patrons. And big thank you here to Jack for sending me the Reshev Slaughterhouse, Thunder in the East, and several David Glantz books. These books were used, but not harmed in the making of this video. Thank you for watching and see you next time.